will spend just a little bit of time on cephalopod reproduction, a huge topic that will narrow down to just a few examples. And then I want to introduce our local Humboldt squid, which has some very nice connections or indications of what climate change is doing to, uh, to natural systems. And then Roger will take over from there. Let's start with our local market squid. Uh, we're all well aware that, that they are here in large numbers in shallow water in order to mate and reproduce. And our market squid fishery is a result of that. Uh, shallow water cephalopods quite frequently, almost always, attach their fertilized eggs to the bottom. Uh, in the case of an octopus, it might be each egg in its own little capsule attached to the roof of a cave or crevice. In that case, the octopus typically guards the eggs until they hatch, and once that's happened, uh, the octopus dies. We've said before that by and large in cephalopods, these animals live fast and die young. And typically, they don't survive the process of reproduction. There are now some uh, examples from the deep sea, uh, some of which Imbari has done on the Davidson Seamount off Big Sur, uh, where there are exceptions to that rule. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few moments. Uh, each of these egg capsules contains anywhere, I think, from 85 to 250 uh, individual little embryos. And they have in them some natural fungicides and uh, antibiotics so that typically they don't get infected and consumed by fungi or anything else while the, uh, the embryos are uh, developing. Another thing to keep in mind is that each of these adult female squids produces hundreds and hundreds, and in some case thousands, of offspring. And the fact that we're not knee deep in any of these animals indicates to you that the majority of these young don't survive uh, to even become juveniles, let alone adults. And so they become a really important uh, element of the food web in the ocean where lots and lots of smallmouth critters feed on these newly hatched young mm -hmm. squids and octopuses. Mm -hmm. There is an example of a brand new, newly hatched little squid. And Dave Eppel could talk a, a lot about these processes and these critters because he spent years studying the embryology of these animals. Uh, that big bulb you see to the right that looks like a light bulb, that's the egg sac. And early on, these little squids aren't feeding. They are actually uh, growing using the materials in the egg sac. And once all of that gets absorbed, then they become little uh, carnivores, mini carnivores in the plankton. Uh, typically, as is typical of most animals, uh, in order to reproduce somehow, the sperm has to be transferred to the female to fertilize the eggs. And in these animals, that often involves the male, usually with a modified arm, uh, transferring a sperm packet to the mantle cavity of a female. Here you see a male octopus on the left transferring a sperm packet to the female on the right. Uh, in many of the squids, there's a lot of competition for this, and it can be a very narrow distinction between actually courtship and reproduction versus cannibalism. Uh, 
but we don't have time to get into a lot of that. Uh, sometimes the female can store the spermatophore for a period of time, and females have been found with several spermatophores in the mantle cavity. So they can fertilize their eggs from more than one male. And uh, sometimes there are, there's evidence that a male will remove spermatophores and replace them with his own. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting behavior going on in this. Uh, boy, this dialogue box is right in front of that picture, and I have to try and remember what the heck the picture is. I can't see it, and I can't get rid of that dialogue box for some strange reason. Anyway, this is a hectocotylus. Often in these animals, uh, not always, but usually uh, one or two of the arms are modified for transferring the sperm packet. This was discovered by Aristotle and later delineated by Cuvier in the early 1800s. Uh, and it was Cuvier who called the modified tips of these arms the hectocotylus. Uh, he initially thought that they were parasitic worms living in the mantle cavity of, of the squid or the octopus, and he named it the genus Hectocotylus. Uh, turns out it's just the torn off tip of the arm that was used to pass a sperm packet. There is lots of variation on the Hectocotylus theme depending on whether you're looking at a squid or an octopus uh, or even a variety of uh, those animals within the squids or the octopuses. So lots of nice illustrations, many of them from the 18th or 19th centuries of the hectocotyli uh, of these animals. Here, I believe, uh, an octopus brooding her eggs on the roof of a little cave. Uh, typically a few weeks in the case of uh, Granulodoni, the deep sea octopus off Big Sur that Ambari uh, was uh, investigating. They went back year after year for four years and that female octopus was still there still brooding her young and in the fourth year she was gone and the the little egg cases on the roof of the cave were gone but the the pedestals of each of the eggs was still there attached to the roof of the cave and so they knew that the eggs had hatched and the female by then had undoubtedly died. To date, I believe that four year period is the longest brooding period of any animal we know, not just cephalopods, but any critter that broods its young, four years is a long, long time. Some things go slowly in the deep sea. Now here is the flamboyant cuttlefish one of my very favorite animals. I had the privilege of diving with these critters uh, in Lembe Strait on Sulawesi in Indonesia three or four years ago and managed to get a little bit of video of them. And we have a wonderful exhibit of these critters at the aquarium in the tentacles exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to visit and, and see them, I recommend it highly while they are there. It is a temporary exhibit, but I think it has another year or so to go. So you have a little bit of time. Uh, and here you see a little bit of video on natural light. So they're not as colorful as they are under the white exhibit lights at the aquarium. You'll notice he's not happy with me being so close. And so he has those two arms 
sticking up in a in an aggressive posture and there is a cluster of egg cases and the reason i share this with you is i'm not at all sure that those are the egg cases of the flamboyant cuttlefish those look to me more like squid or maybe cuttlefish egg cases but they look remarkably similar to our local market squid egg cases that we see here here are some octopus eggs and you see the embryos developing within the egg capsule there. And this is Granulodoni, the deep sea octopus that Ambari was uh, investigating off Big Sur on the Davidson Seamount. I, I, I don't remember exactly, I think, think in the neighborhood of two or 3,000 feet deep. And this is the one that brooded its young for four years. Now here's a really interesting exception to the rule. This is an Imbari shot. And by the way, if you haven't visited the Imbari website, uh, click on products and then on cephalopods, they have both stills and videos of some of these wonderful deep sea cephalopods. This is a squid female who carries her developing eggs with her rather than releasing them into the plankton as many of the open water uh, squids do. Uh, instead, she carries her young with her and it looks like there are hundreds of individual little developing offspring there. And how long that happens, uh, I'm not sure we know. Here's our local Humboldt squid. That's about as large as they get. The mantle length between two and three feet and then the total body length up to seven or eight feet. This is the range of the Humboldt squid from way down in Southern Chile up to about Point Conception. And then in the last 10 to 20 years, the northern boundary has been creeping north all the way up to the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, Humboldt squids are vertical migrators. They spend daytime down at depth, several hundred to maybe 1,500 feet deep. And then they come up at night to feed in the shallow, more productive surface layers. Uh, on a lot of the other vertical migrators and on shallow water nocturnal fishes like lantern fishes and on each other. There is a lot of cannibalism among Humboldt squids. Uh, something that's interesting, and this is Bill Gilley's research at Hopkins Marine Station. I, I put a reference for his work uh, on the reference sheet there. Uh, over the past few years, his work in the Gulf of California, the Humboldt squid have becoming smaller and smaller. And it seems to be a, uh, a response to less and less food in the surface waters as things are getting warmer and warmer. And so they live about the same length of time, but instead of maturing at two or three feet uh, or six or eight feet long, they mature at 18 inches long. Uh, this is less true as you move north in the Gulf of California, where they uh, can find colder water at depth and still are pretty good size. But the ones off Santa Rosalia down in the southern third of the Gulf have become progressively smaller. And then on the west coast, again, their range has crept up to British Columbia and even to the Gulf of Alaska. These animals typically live about 450 days. And so here again, they live fast and die young. Uh, that is the track of the Ricketts and Steinbeck crews into the Gulf, the Western Flyer. Uh, they were primarily focusing on, on the intertidal critters, but they do make reference to the Humboldt squids. Uh, this is work at Embari, uh, a postdoc and 
fellow named Burford, I think, in Bill Gilley's lab at Hopkins, uh, going through hours and hours and hours of archival footage of Humboldt squids in Ambari's archives and enumerating all of the different color and pattern changes that, that they find in that archival footage. And now they're trying to uh, figure out, okay, what does it all mean? When the squid is doing this or that or the other thing, what is it conveying? It's pretty clear that there's some kind of visual communication going on here. And in some cases, they've been able to close the loop and you see similar things in some other animals, including an octopus we had on exhibit at the aquarium in the tentacles exhibit a couple of years ago, a day octopus, uh, which was uh, doing the pigmentation and pattern on one side and then a perfectly clear line down the middle and basic white on the other side. Uh, one of Roger Hanlon's YouTube videos shows the same thing in the Atlantic squid where the male squid is mating or courting a female and the side toward the female is pigmented exactly like the female is, and the other side is bone white. And then in the video, the male changes sides, and so the pigmentation pattern and the bone white changes sides instantaneously as he does that. So he's signaling one thing to the female, and probably with the bone white signaling stay away from me to everybody else. Folks, that uh, brings me to the end of my brief introduction to the Humboldt squid. I think Roger is going to uh, tell you a little more about that animal. There's one thing I did not mention that I will. I mentioned that a lot of these open water squids uh, don't attach their eggs to the bottom. Instead, they produce mucousy transparent egg cases that can be quite large. In the case of the Humboldt squid, it's the size of, oh, like a large golf bag, something like two or three or four feet long and maybe a foot or two across with, again, uh, thousands of developing embryos. But it's in this mucousy egg case that's just drifting in the plankton. And once again, most of them will get eaten before they metamorphose and become juvenile squid. With that, I'm going to bow out here and then I will turn it over to Roger. Well, there's two things I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to talk about. One, there are so many different species. Uh, and there's some that almost no one has ever seen except people with of remote submarines, but we certainly are aware of these things. And we they're in our subconscious from the first time we hear the word octopus. And I want to start on this. Octopuses are incredibly successful. There's lots of reasons, uh, some of them having to do with the, their large genome. They can modify whatever protein they think they need, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, they're intelligent, they have memory, they learn. We have great resources. One, of course, is the Embari, but also YouTube. Uh, YouTube is both academic as, and as well as entertainment. And if you see this little logo, go and all you have to do is do something like Broad Club Cuttlefish. And this video is amazing. It's from Blue Planet. And this dark cuttlefish here, it sees a crab, comes up like this, makes this form, and then flushes itself with rainbow colors. And the crab is just bedazzled. And then it shoots out its, its tentacles. You will be hypnotized if you watch this thing. It's, it's remarkable. This is the larger striped octopus. They are subtle. They look at a shrimp 
and they tap it on the back and the shrimp just <laughs> darts right into the to the to the mouth of the octopus recently some scientists uh put a cuttlefish in a uh, situation where they had to engage in the stanford marshmallow test which is delightful and if you just want to watch kids having uh, a frustrating time uh, this test is you give them a marshmallow you say if you don't eat this for two minutes or three minutes then i'll give you two marshmallows and of course they're looking at the marshmallow and they're just they can't control themselves well they did this with cuttlefish but of course it's a shrimp and they said if eventually they told them if you don't eat this particular squid we'll give you a good one so it, it they passed this test uh, with flying colors which is remarkable Plus, uh, well, I've learned so much, say, from Dave Eppel and exposed so many of my students to his uh, urchin embryos. <laughs> if you take our local urchin and tease them with some chemicals or an electrical charge, you can get them to spawn. And if you have right temperatures, you can watch them reproduce and watch the embryos. That's amazing. Well, Almost everything we understand about neurology has come from working with the giant axons uh, of cephalopods. And also the fact that they die young, that means they degenerate very quickly. How? So uh, is there a way of reversing this? The poisons that they have in there uh, are mostly tetrodotoxins, but those can work to block pain and so on. I'm just gonna give you some other examples. Here's a very famous uh, cup, uh, guys who won the Nobel Prize, shared it for how nerves are transmitted. And they use the market squid. Uh, and this is the world's largest neuron. <laughs> it just happens they discovered upon it and they could take it out and put it on a petri dish or a slide and experiment, uh, attach electrodes and so on, oscilloscopes. So our understanding of neurotransmitters, synapses, all came from squid. Cuttlefish have this lovely little unique, uniquely constructed bone. It is now being used as a pattern, as a uh, model for building construction material and packaging material. The suckers are incredible. And so now they're being used surgically, particularly on things like hearts to close wounds. And there's other polymers uh, that are coming from the ocean, but just the idea of someone using uh, artificial suckers to close wounds. Steve briefly mentioned there are a whole bunch of things uh, uh, that are being developed, electronic clothing in essence, that mimics octopus and squid skin so it can instantly match the background. And Roger Hanlon, who's at, uh, I think he's at Woods Hole, uh, has a defense contract to try to see if they can develop camouflage uniforms. Some of the skin has become a model for uh, thermoregulatory clothing that can actually change its thermal dynamics. And this is a guy, Gordetsky, who's at uh, UC Irvine. And squid have been, and octopuses, are a model for all kinds of new uh, underwater vehicles and these have already been built uh, some of them have cameras some of them are being used to carry things uh, so robotic tentacles to pick things up that are wet and oddly shaped and whole octopuses uh, syn synthetically designed my favorite oh and and here if you want to watch some of these there's a youtube just 
type in robotic octopus. <laughs> They're amazing. This is the one of the truly amazing things. It's a 3D, completely soft, uh, autonomous robot that can be programmed. It's very tiny. It's very cute. It's that they did it at MIT. I saw a demonstration of this. And it is powered by um, hydrogen peroxide that uh, is flushed over a, a plate and it produces hydrogen that powers something. Briefly, we mentioned, yes, lots of people eat cephalopods. I'm always uh, torn. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they are mobile, they're adaptable. And as Steve mentioned, the Humboldt squid is spreading. And these may be very important food items in the future. You see a curve like this that's going up. You would think it would plunge, but it hasn't. It seems like squid may be benefiting, like jellyfishes are, to the changes in the ocean climate and the removal of big predators. So it's very likely these things will become more important in the future. I just came from Greece not too long ago, and it's still uh, something you can't avoid. Mezzies from uh, all kinds of, uh, mostly the vulgar octopus or the common octopus and, and squid with fava beans and so on, uh, and a little glass of ouzo. Squid industry is enormous. Uh, the Chinese fleet, I travel a lot in Southeast Asia, and the, the ocean at night is not dark. It is lit up everywhere. In fact, satellites track the squid fleet. Uh, this is the Chinese squid fleet in South America, taking advantage of the Humboldt squid. Notice they were around the Falklands, now they're kept off. Uh, they've been encroaching on the Galapagos, they're now uh, kept away from the Galapagos, but, uh, and these are amazing things because quite often this is all automated in the sense that put down hooks with little side loom lures that also get washed up on the beaches. But what is more unique and more enigmatic than a cephalopod? O is for octopus, and they have long intrigued us and inspired us. Again, I was fortunate enough to go spend quite a bit of time in Canosos and Crete, uh, and just you go into the villages and they're still eating octopus, but these are 3,000 year old vases from Canosos and beautiful patterns. Uh, and of course, they inspire modern artists. Here are Northwest Clinket and Haida art, all based on octopuses and squid. During the Edo period, men wore uh, robes and so you needed to close your sash. And so these were sort of belt buckles, Natsuke, and one of the more popular uh, themes were octopuses and squid. and this being Japanese, it became somewhat pornographic later. These are highly collectible and very, very uh, expensive if you try to get them. Many of them are ivory or are tusks. Also, the fishermen in Japan used to uh, make record of what they caught with ink and they would paint whatever they caught with sumi ink and then place paper on it and make a goitako print. And this was one of the favorite things that I used to do with my students. Uh, the, the aquarium did it. Uh, I used to actually uh, love to do flounders or something like that. And of course, I'd have everyone bring in underwear or t-shirts. We'd paint the, paint the animal. And then I'd show them how to do it, which is I would press my chest on top of this squid. Of course, that's not how you do it. But anyway, you get some beautiful things. Uh, and this is still a traditional art. Another art version. Uh, my sister was an expert in this. This is paper cut out with tiny little exacto knives. 
of course, uh, this is a friend of mine who does these, makes a good living. <laughs> uh, they're hard to do, but people love them. And jewelry, uh, intriguing and so on. And art has always benefited by this, these stimuli. This, of course, is Ernst Haeckel, uh, a, a great biologist, evolutionary opponent, but nonetheless uh, opened our eyes to a lot of the ocean's creatures. Uh, there used to be squid festivals in, in lots of places, uh, especially India Joe's and Santa Cruz. Uh, not only was it a squid festival, it also was a fashion show. So for years, people would come dressed or draped in squid or octopuses, whatever they could. And uh, this is a remarkable artist, I think, a fantasist artist, but just fun to look at what he does. Um, and just kind of tea, play, play with your notions of what is real. People still like to do this. And I think it's, uh, well, psychologically, what we think, what would it be like if we had tentacles? Uh, maybe it's an envy. Ray Troll, who's a friend of Steve's and myself, who lives up in Alaska, he's a fabulous artist and he has a showroom. Also, he publishes books and is very comical in some respects. One of the most popular tattoo motifs, and for some reason, women prefer these. Uh, men prefer skulls uh, for whatever reason. Uh, Freud would have a heyday trying to interpret this. If you are still stressed by COVID, you can buy an octopus coloring book made just for adults. That means, uh, there are more lines you have to stay inside of. Or you could just wear your octopus and there's carpets, there's blankets, there's socks, all sorts of things. You uh, don't have to go far to find this. There used to be a lot of uh, octopuses and squid in Santa Cruz on Halloween. You can still buy these. This is actually a real costume. It's a skin with uh, latex. We'd like to play on them and like to be frightened by big things or outsized things. So all over the world, you'll run into these. Uh, there's a town, uh, my grandson sent me a picture. There's a town in Japan that got some stimulus money from COVID to kind of help people through. So what they did with that is they built a giant uh, flying squid model they said, well, in the future, tourists will come back and they'll want to see that. We used to have a, a clam chowder and calamari festival here. And there's the uh, India Joe's festival. Uh, if you Google squid now, you're going to find a very strange game uh, that is called squid based on a game in Korea. <laughs> and I, I just want to bring that up. Briefly, of course, squid have, and octopuses have been in mythology, but also in literature. Everyone's familiar with Jules Verne, but you may not know Victor Hugo wrote a book prior to that called The Toilers of the Sea. He was exiled to Guernsey from France, uh, and he heard a lot of stories, wrote this, and actually they made a movie uh, in 1936. You can find it once in a while. And of course, everyone knows Jules Verne, 1870. How many movie versions? It's endless. <laughs> there are so many movie versions of this, uh, starting in 1907. And of course, now Marvel Comics has uh, Dr. Octopus, who is very fun to watch. Uh, originally in the cartoon characters, he wasn't much, but now in the movie version with CG, he is quite threat, uh, threatening. And of course, not to forget H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote uh, a short story, which then 
became very, very popular, the Cthulhu uh, series and various movies and cartoons have been made about this uh, kind of combination, octopus head, bat wings and so on. And it, everything we dislike rolled into one gigantic octopus head, bat wings and so on. And lest we forget H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. And this kind of set the trend for octopoid aliens. Uh, how many times has this been done? War of the Worlds has been made into theater productions, video, all sorts of things. And of course, movies picked this up very quickly. Uh, these are some of my favorite movies uh, that, <laughs> Shh, The Octopus, isn't that a wonderful title? And uh, uh, Reap the, the Wild Wind and Wake of the Red Witch. I have those asterisks because who starred in these? None other than the Duke, John Wayne. How <laughs> we don't associate with uh, octopus monsters. And then of course it became a huge part of the space trope. Uh, as a kid, I was sort of fascinated by this uh, forbidden knowledge about underwater things. And so there was Argosy, men's magazine, Spice, Spicy Adventure Stories, Man's, I love the title, Man's Conquest. And of course, how often it was a cephalopod that we had to fight. And it, it goes on. I tried to come up with an idea about tentacle phobia, branchiophobia, uh, fear of tentacles. And it's promulgated. Here's Ursula in The Little Mermaid. Uh, why do we have to turn an octopus into an evil witch-like character? And I, I find later there is an accepted phobia. This is an older term uh, that means fear of cephalopods. And I'm sure it has to do with the tentacles. Uh, cephalopods have always been an image for political uh, shenanigans and monopolies and so on. So it is uh, rampant and still used. Now with CG and great latex things, of course, here was the Dead Men's Curse, 2006 from Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, this is a whole movie, a whole industry based on a, what, a park ride, an amusement ride in a park, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and one of my favorites, of course, <laughs> Galaxy Quest and the Thermians. Uh, there's a little scene in here. It's a spoof on Star Trek, if you haven't seen it. It's a real fun thing to watch, particularly this scene where a uh, monk, whatever his name is, makes love with an alien. And then a, one of his partners comes and looks down and says, that ain't right. And of course, Arrival. Wouldn't, I could just predict Arrival. What is it? It's an alien. What kind of an alien? Octopodal <laughs> or cephalopodal alien. We can't get away from it. Slender Man. This is a kind of uh, creepy pasta. Uh, it's bogus. However, it's become real. And this is part of the way fake knowledge becomes part of the real news. This was originally a 2009 blog. And then people started saying, hey, I've seen them. They published Photoshopped images of the Slender Man who kidnaps kids and he's thin and kind of creepy, uh, spidery. But as he progresses, he becomes branched and tentacular. And of course, now there's a movie out. In 2018, they made a movie, which now makes this a meme and makes this a kind of cultural phenomenon, even though it started as something bogus, which is how fake news becomes, uh, and people are studying this, how fake news moves and gets substantiated, if you will. Uh, we still have fear, and it's almost always a sexual fear or just the fear of being touched, tentacles. 
uh, even I have to pay tribute because there's another Doctor Who coming out and here's the odd kind who are telepathic, uh, whatever you want to call them, cephalopod heads. Well, they have two heads. They have a cephalopod head and then their own head, but anyway. But thankfully, a lot of that was reversed in part by my octopus teacher, although this is panned and a lot of people don't like it, but they're in the minority. It did win an Oscar uh, and it well-deserved. The photography is fantastic. And there is this article, which is quite intriguing, that they have fast life histories. They're not very social, yet they can uh, adapt very quickly, avoid predators, uh, and they do have this remarkable intelligence. Are they conscious? Well, it depends on your definition. I taught in a program at the University of Santa Cruz called the History of Consciousness, and almost all the only thing we ever did was try to define it. Uh, I used to call it the history of unconsciousness because most of my students were altered in one way or another. Uh, are you aware of yourself? And of course, how do you prove that? Well, cephalopods can pass any of these tests. Uh, are they sentient? Well, then you get into other things of what does sentience mean? They have memory and so on. Well, do they feel emotion? If you've ever been around them, Yes, they flash, they're communicating. They don't like certain people. They can taste people. They will squirt water at certain people. They can recognize faces, so on. This brings us to uh, the Francis Crick Memorial Conference in 2012. Francis Crick, you may remember that name. Uh, Watson and Crick discovers uh, well, I should say they purloined a lot of their information from Rosalind Franklin uh, to figure out the structure of DNA. They had a lot of help, uh, but nonetheless, they got recognized because by that time, Rosalind Franklin had, had died. But Crick went off, came to San Diego actually, uh, and studied uh, squid eyes because he was very interested in consciousness and vision. And he, uh, became very much involved in the idea of consciousness and working with squid and so on, he helped uh, create the idea that non-animals, including mammals and other creatures, including octopuses, possess the neurological substrate for consciousness. And this is a Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness and immediately newspapers and others picked this up, animal consciousness officially recognized. And this sounds kind of funny in some respect, but it led to laws all over the, all over the world, New Zealand, France, Europe, uh, where animals cannot be cooked alive, among other things, or they have to be anesthetized if they're gonna be researched upon and so on and so on. A new brand new journal has been uh, released called Animal Sentiments. So this is a recognition of we share this planet with some very unique animals. Uh, they probably ask the same questions of us. They don't destroy their habitat. We're the only animal that destroys its own uh, possibility of even evolving further. I scheduled this because uh, a long time ago, because I remember Octopus Day falls in October. This is just going to be a very quick, somewhat taxonomic tour of the creatures. There are seven species of nautiloids, and they're mostly in the Southeast Pacific why just there? Why haven't they spread? That's an interesting question. They are spreading a little bit across around India, and they've been here for 500 million years. Uh, humans like to think they're the cat's meow. We've been here less than 200,000 years. So these guys have figured out something. They are vertical migrators. Uh, very intriguing, much more uh, socially 
active than we would give them credit for. Here's part of their daily migration. They have over a hundred or so tentacles, if you want to call them that, and they do have tentacular ability, kind of like the water balloon squeezing, and they can grab something with all of these. Sadly, they are heavily collected because people will pay a lot of money for them, and all that happens is sometimes they're cut in half uh, and then sold for lots of money. Uh, they're trapped. They're not, you can eat them. Very few people do eat them. This has been going on for a long time. These are things that you will find mostly in the Netherlands uh, or in Europe. These are nautiloids, pearly nautiloids, polished so that the stripes are removed, turned into all sorts of uh, cups or serving dishes. There are lots of squids. So I don't want to labor you about all the types. Cuttlefish we've talked about with their cuddle bone and their uniquely uh, pupiled eye. Lots of different behaviors, colors, uh, and they're pretty abundant. And like most of these, they go through size evolution. Some can be really, really tiny, and some can get almost kind of uh, terrestrial in that the flamboyant one tends to walk uh, as much as it swims. These, Steve briefly alluded to the life history, attached eggs. And yes, I agree with you, Steve, those were not, those are squid eggs because uh, cuttlefish eggs are always these kind of light bulb shaped things. And they come out, and this is one of the few, they're completely like a little uh, adult, very colorful. This is the spirula or the ram's horn. And it's one that has kept right here uh, a little kind of miniature internal shell that has hollows. And it looks just like a nautiloid shell, but it, it's hollowed and it's used as part of flotation, because to stay in the same level, you need to have some sort of neutral buoyancy. Notice how it swims, and it also has uh, a luminous uh, area at the end. These are, oh, how, how do I describe these? These are pygmy squid that are very hard to find. They're very abundant. It just takes someone very patient. Uh, they lay their eggs on Sea, sea grasses and other uh, sea plants. They also spend their day glued to these quite often. And so they do have a cement gland and people are looking at this adhesive because it works well when it's wet. And they're, they're still squid, so they will ink and they'll do all these little uh, behavioral patterns. It's so exciting to find one of these things. Uh, they're about the size of a paper clip. The bobtail uh, squid are just delightful. We talked a little bit about them because they pick up, uh, once they're born, they have to absorb these different kinds of bacteria. The bacteria pick up uh, genes from the squid and then turn, uh, are in turn are able to kill other bacteria that would be harmful to the squid and harmful to uh, the luminescent squid. So very interesting little symbiotic relationship and people are studying this because we too have a very complex uh, microbiome of all kinds of bacteria that live in our gut and elsewhere that may be involved with uh, metabolism and obesity and all sorts of other things like Crohn's disease. These, this is the Hawaiian bobtail squid, luminescent, just absolutely beautiful uh, and very tiny. <laughs> the stubby or uh, dumpling squid, you wouldn't guess this is, as a squid until you see it swim away. This is a deep water animal. The bottle tail squid, I don't know much about except that it tends to be near the bottom and can be very deep water too. Uh, look at that big, huge siphon. So they are uh, capable of swimming. This is one of a family of deep water squids. 
And this, like the Humboldt squid, carries the egg case. In fact, Steve did mention this particular one. Uh, this is vertical, and this is the Ambari picture, Gonadus, and this is the egg case here. This is a par para larvae. That is, once they hatch out, they're a miniature version of itself. They also have these, I'm not sure if these are part of the mating or part of early egg cases. This is called the swimming club <laughs> squid. And look at, at the very end, this long, long modified tentacle uh, has a little club on it. And it's mostly used apparently as a lure. And Bari has watched these things and it's fishing. And maybe I don't know if it can uh, reel it in. Steve can maybe tell us. The market squid is it's are two different families. There's over uh, 50 different species. This is, by the way, Steve from 1984. You may remember that because you were working at the aquarium and it was a, it was the water temperature off Monterey was 73 and we were invaded by pleurincodes. These are uh, tuna shrimp or tuna, yeah. And you could find these. This is, that was taken in Monterey. This is Lalago, very complicated. Uh, courtship that sometimes uh, there'll be sneaker males and they lay these egg cases in. This is a paralarvae again. Uh, very beautiful to watch. Here's the, um, we used to bring these into lab and see if we could get them to hatch it. Uh, it took a long time and a lot of clean water. Now the last thing you would expect is for squid to fly. But this is a flying squid. They're very beautiful. They go backwards, if you will, uh, get up enough speed and then open up their, uh, their fins. And they often, since many of these open water squid are schoolers, they will come up in mass. There's another, uh, there's a whole family of flying squid and these are bigger and they're often in, and very common in the Japanese market. This is the distribution. I've only ever seen them uh, up here north of Japan. And then here's a bigger called the purple back flying squid. This is a small juvenile and you begin to see this one is quite widespread and you would not think that squid would develop the ability to fly in so many different places. Most of the world's space to live is in the deep ocean. And of course, there are many, many kinds of creatures that are restricted. And there is a whole group of bathypelagic. And bathypelagic is this area, the largest space, 60% of all of the uh, space basically on our planet is in, in this deep part of the ocean. Many things will climb up or swim up and come back down during the day, which is very intriguing. The largest animal migration in the world takes place every night in the ocean. When things come up at night to feed on what's left up there uh, and then during the day go back to hide in the darkness and one of the great food chains is actually all the poop that these things leave because that poop falls down, gets attacked by fungus and bacteria and turns into a, a flocculent called marine snow. But we used to think that this was a false bottom because if you have sonar, the sonar would show the, the it looked like you were coming on a mountain because this means all of these creatures are migrating up here. This is called the deep scattering layer. And what's in that? Well, all kinds of copepods and shrimp and my favorite pteropods. These are the sea butterflies. Uh, and many of these things are either transparent or they're red because red is the first color 
to disappear when you're going deep in the ocean. These are worms actually here. And then of course, bigger things come up to eat those, including lots of squid. This is a pteropod, this is a lanternfish, viper fish, and so on. And many larvae squid live in that deep scattering layer going up and down as they feed on all those tiny things and try to avoid being eaten themselves. So many of them are either reddish or transparent so they can hide in the darkness. Some of them, um, like this creature, which uh, migrates up and down, but also comes near shore. This is the Japanese firefly. And it has uh, photophores all over its body and can sparkle just like a firefly, light up the ocean itself. This is an equivalent to a Humboldt, not as big as a Humboldt squid called the diamond squid. These are larvae and the larvae tend to be uh, deep pelagic, uh, deep bathypelagic form. They get pretty big. They're very common in Korea and in Japan. It's uh, a real treat, although it's not as much treat since they've changed, modernized the Tokyo market, fish market to see some of these things. Steve alluded to the fact that some of these pelagic forms that will carry egg masses and some of them lay unbelievable egg masses. So the diamond squid is one of these that lays, <laughs> uh, I don't some sort of gelatinous mucus thing that will have millions, tens of thousands of eggs in them. And sometimes they'll float into shore if you're near a uh, deep water on an, a tropical island or it doesn't even have to be a tropical. Uh, I've seen this in Okinawa. So uh, then Steve briefly alluded to the cockeyed uh, squid, Histiotuthis, which is a unique genus uh, of deep water squids. And it has its left eye enormous and recently, uh, well, not too long ago, Duke people working with Mbari figured out when they saw it swimming like this, the left eye looking up to see any kind of things that might be below it. You don't need a big eye to look down at what might be luminescent be below it. So uh, the cockeyed squid, it's related. It, this is a different species of histiotuthis. This is the called um, actually the strawberry squid, not the cockeyed squid, but you see all these photophores and still has a fairly big left eye. I remember when Mbari first saw this creature, the big fin, and <laughs> they couldn't figure it out for love nor money. I still don't think anyone's quite figured it out because quite often it will bend its arms in various uh, angular positions and float around like that. Uh, so 1998, this is a strange deep water uh, squid. There's the squid. As a juvenile, it floats vertically and it's probably, the best guess is it imitating or mimicking a siphonophore, which has stinging cells and not necessarily tasty. So as a juvenile, it pretends to just be a gelatinous floating uh, siphonophore. Everyone loves to hear about colossal squid uh, or giant squid and how big they can get this is the best picture. So there's a two meter person. So if you look at the, the mantle, it's probably anything from two to maybe two and a half meters. That's all. Well, if you add the, the arms and the tentacles are going to get much bigger. So this is one that has been pulled up. Colossal squid, you see this very big uh, fin structure, very distinctive and very capable of very fast speeds. I love, I love this, I just, this would be 30 feet. Uh, this would be a 60 feet beast in this representation. No, they don't get that big. So you have to be very careful on the internet. Uh, this is the giant squid. It doesn't have much of a fin structure. It does have much longer tentacles 
Uh, these are the feeding tentacles, remember. Uh, no one's sure, they're found all over the world. Uh, male and female are dimorphic. And you wonder, a lot of people debate whether it's one species or 17 species. And yes, they have been found in the stomachs along uh, with the, the beaks uh, of sperm whale, but not just sperm whale, there are a whole group of whales called the uh, strap tooth whales uh, that are almost as big and they are deep diving and they're probably eating these and Humboldt squid. This is a, not so big, <laughs> uh, what's called the club hook squid. This one was from uh, Arcata and this was actually in the Humboldt uh, University Marine Lab. Or, so. Um, they're out there. They do have clubs on uh, hooks on their tentacles. Many, many deep water uh, squid are transparent, just like other things. This is a family called the Cranchid squid. I love this one because he looks like he's dancing. But some of these are larvae, but some of these are full adults. So. Uh, it's a real mystery, but they're so beautiful. Now, the octopuses, remember they're just for our purposes, they're squid and octopus, uh, nautilus and vampire squid. But the octopi, octopuses, there are 13 families. And the vampire squid, it's not a squid, neither is it a vampire, but nonetheless, it's put in with the octopuses. Uh, it does have fins. It does have these strange tendrils that hang down. And at the tip of every arm, there is a luminescent organ. So quite often what you would see at night is this thing. Well, not at night, but if you were down there, it's dark anyway. So uh, that's what you would see. And how are these used? Well, this is the typical feeding. They often invert and pull their arms uh, and they're webbing backwards and then just kind of drift down. Again, look at Mbari or YouTube to see this. It's quite remarkable. The Argonaut, which is one of my favorite creatures, it's, it can get quite large, uh, but it's actually an octopus that builds a shell. And it's usually the female, it's almost always a female, who builds a shell and actually lays her eggs inside the shell and carries them with us. Another variation on the reproductive theme. And here is the hectocotylus arm. You can see it. This is the male. Shellless, tiny, makes this huge hectocotylus arm, which has sperm packets. It, if it gets close, it will latch it anywhere he can to the nautilus. And the only time, well, sometimes when you see them in the open ocean, where you see them is floating around on top of jellyfish. Uh, they can be found on the surface, but quite often they're found just as young ones. And they make this shell. Now, early on, again, Aristotle, who uh, studied, had a, a little lagoon near Lesbos Island in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. And he thought that this modified arm was actually a sail. And so they often pitch, picture these as sailing across the sea. So he called this the sailor, and this was an argonaut. It turns out this is, and this was figured out by uh, Jean Power, who was a seamstress in rural France, uh, went to, walked all the way to Paris, learned how to become a better seamstress, she married and went to Sicily and there she set up boxes to hold some of these animals. And so she invented the aquarium. She also had aquarium that she could put under the water, but she figured out by keeping uh, Argonauts or paper Nautiluses that they use that weird adaptation, this, to build their shell. So this is, kind of a modified mantle. Well, it's actually an arm, but none, nonetheless, it can build the shell that way. Everyone's favorite, uh, the uh, Dumbo 
octopus or umbrella octopus. There are lots of different species, lots of different places. You can find them deep ocean or even on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they can swim like squid in a sense, uh, very beautiful. And then many other octopuses are just strictly pelagic. We know very little about them. And being uh, pelagic, it's helpful to be transparent so no one can really see them. Oops. And it's still important to look up. <laughs> so this is called the telescope octopus and its eyes are peering up all the time because it's uh, looking out for something that might come down and eat it and also quite transparent. Uh, this is an octopus that Steve mentioned that uh, has been found on uh, Davidson Mount. It's also been found uh, occupying all these whale falls. This is a whale. Once they die, they fall down and things live everywhere on them. They eat the bones, they eat the flesh, and these octopuses are very common. Uh, we tend to think of big giant octopuses. This is the star sucker, not the smallest, but one of the smallest. Uh, this is an Atlantic uh, pygmy. <laughs> of course, this is a larvae, but this is a full grown adult essentially. And one of my favorites is the Lilliput long arm, which is related to the mimicking octopus because it's capable of mimicking as well. Here is a paralarvae. These are paralarvae that are probably living high up in the water column. And then the seven arm octopus, which can surprisingly get quite large. Uh, it's very streamlined, uh, little known about it. The large Indian or Pacific striped octopus, very bizarre very social. Uh, I think, correct me, Steve, but I think this is one of those that is repeated, capable of repeating matings. Um, they're just a strange animal. It also is one of these that can tap uh, a shrimp on the back and get it to swim into its mouth. Now, I have to end with this just because it's one of my favorites. Uh, you're in the ocean <laughs> and you see glints of light and you see something like trash. And if you're lucky enough to get close to it, this is what you see. This is the blanket octopus. It's pretty widespread. I've seen it mostly in the tropical Atlantic, South Atlantic, but unbelievable. I don't know if the aquariums ever tried to get these. One of the problems is the fact that even though they're gorgeous, the male, <laughs> if this was a female here, that's the male. So the female is about 40,000 times bigger than the male. Uh, they weren't discovered until something like 2000. Uh, so these are tiny, tiny planktonic males, essentially. They also pick up Portuguese man of war uh, stinging cells. So if you get close and you want to touch them, it's quite often you get stung by these things. Uh, and they also have these ocelli, and that sometimes can be used to bring a predator in who bites this, uh, and then the octopus will actually just uh, compress and swim away. So it's sort of attracting it to just part of the webbing rather than to the head. Octopuses are conscious and they deserve our respect and our admiration. And I'm so happy to be able to share this with you. And thank Michelle and thank Steve for making all this possible.